India has extraordinary tailwinds right now because there's a fundamental desire by all companies and frankly com uh, governments to move supply chains out of China. They are moving them everywhere, right? Like they're moving to Mexico and Vietnam and Indonesia, et cetera. But frankly, the only place that really has proper scale is India in terms of like manufacturing capacity and capacity to really replace these supply chains. So our core thesis in India right now is B2B marketplaces helping move supply chains, I guess, French shoring would be the thing out of China into India. Today we had Fabrice Grinda on the podcast. Fabrice is among the world's leading internet entrepreneurs and investors. Fabrice was named the number one angel investor in the world by Forbes. Fabrice founded FJ Labs and today FJ Labs is one of the most active investors globally. FJ Labs has invested in companies like Airbnb, Alibaba, Instacart, Flexport, to name a few. In this conversation, we cover topics like the founding story of FJ Labs, what's the portfolio construction of FJ Labs, how to raise capital and build relationships with limited partners, why Fabrice believes fund managers with diversified portfolio will perform, fund managers with concentrated portfolio over a long period of time, importance of building a brand as a fund manager, hardest part about building a venture firm, what's his thesis for India and why is he excited about India, who is the outside of work and much more. Now I bring you Fabrice. Cool. Uh, Fabrice, excited to have you on the pod. Excited to be here. Fabrice, uh, maybe a good starting point could be uh, what led you to start FJ Labs? What was the founding story? I would say I'm an accidental venture capitalist. I never set out to create a venture capital firm. And it happened uh, over time and kind of gradually. So I became a tech founder back in 1998 when I built my first venture-backed tech company. So I was 23. And because I was such a consumer-facing public internet CEO, a lot of other founders came to me and said, hey, can you help me? Can you give me advice? Can you invest? And back then, and for the longest time, I'm like, should I be an angel investor? Is it a distraction from my core mission as a founder? And ultimately, I, I decided that if I can articulate lessons learned to others, uh, it makes me a better founder. And if I keep my fingers on the pulse of the market by understanding what are the trends, and I was running an eBay type site, so it's a horizontal site. So if I can see what all the vertical sites are doing, it makes me a better founder. Uh, and so I basically started angel investing back in 1998. And I came up with a perspective that as long as it wasn't distracted, didn't take too much time, it was okay. And so I came up with the a, a process with four selection criteria where I would evaluate a company in four in one hour over four cri criteria. And because I was myself building a multi-sided marketplace, I'm like, I'm only going to do multi-sided marketplaces. And that just took on a life of its own. So, and I built another big venture back company after that, and then a third one, OLX. And in 2013, I sold OLX and. And I, well, I sold in 2010, but I left in 2013. And at that point, I'd already made over 170 uh, investments. I had dozens of exits. I was doing really well. And I'm like, you know, I like building companies. I like investing in companies. I'm going to create a holding company with my business partner, uh, Jose Marin, where we are going to build companies, invest in companies. And that was 2013. It was called FJ Labs. But the idea was not to build a venture fund. The idea was just we invest our own capital. We keep behaving like angels. Mm -hmm. And the accidental part is because it became so big and, and it took a life of its own, a bunch of uh, strategics started approaching us and saying, hey, we want exposure to what you're doing. We want to understand what's going on in the U.S. from a marketplace perspective to understand and adapt to our markets. Would you take some capital from us? And in 2016, that led to our first fund with one LP. We gave us 50 million because they wanted exposure to what we were doing. And mm -hmm. that was the beginning of it. And then, of course, it took on a life of its own. And voila. <laughs> Got it. And Fabrice, uh, you have, uh, you know, one of the most interesting uh, fund model. And what that means is, you know, you're investing uh, across stages uh, where you're keeping the core, which is marketplaces. And, and you're, you are the, you know, one of the, or you could be actually the uh, most active investor globally, uh, and you're investing in 30 different geographies. So maybe let's break it into a few parts. One, how did you come up with the portfolio construction that you have? How have you modeled your fund? 
so I'll start by saying that I did not model my fund, and I, I did not. I do not do portfolio construction. My portfolio construction is bottoms up, uh, meaning I see deals. If I like the deal, I invest. If I don't like the deal, I don't invest. And then at the end of the year, I see where it stands. And at the end of the fund, I see where it stands. And I, the only thing I respect are my four selection criteria for whether or not I invest in a company. And it, it has kept me disciplined in 2021 because I'm price sensitive. And one of my criteria is deal terms. I was not investing in late stage. And so I moved earlier stage. And, and there are periods where some geographies, you know, feel they, they don't make sense, I move away from them. So I stopped investing in Russia after uh, Russia invested cri inv invaded Crimea in 2014, which proved mm -hmm. to be a right choice, or after Erdogan became president of Turkey in Turkey. Um, and so be basically, it's all bottoms up. Uh, and now that said, there's a lot of data and evidence to suggest that my strategy is the best strategy. Um, there are a number of people that have done Monte, Monte Carlo simulations, a different portfolio construction. There's AngelList that has published multiple papers on what is the ideal venture portfolio construction. And it's basically our portfolio construction, which is uh, very diversified across stages, industries, and geography. Um, now, in their case, it probably wouldn't be even, diver it would probably even be diversified in business model. Just so mm -hmm. happens I have a comparative advantage in, uh, in in marketplaces in terms of both deal flow and pattern recognition, which is why I focus on that. But yes, we are one of the most prolific, not the most prolific. We've made 1,100 investments and we've had 300 exits over 25 years, including the angel investments. But of course, most of these are venture investments made in the three funds uh, I built. Obviously, I told you about the 50 million fund one, uh, but we also have 175 million fund two from 2018 and 21, and mm -hmm. a 290 million fund three from um, uh, from July 21 to basically mid 25. And uh, that's most uh, of the investors we're gonna make. So it's bottoms up completely. It's, I like something, I invest. I don't like something, I don't invest. So uh, okay. no wealth that we define. I'm not looking for a number of deals. It used to be that I invested in 150 deals a year and now I'm investing more than like 300. It was not a conscious choice. It's mm -hmm. just based on the funnel. What do I like? And if I see yeah. something I like, I invest. Got it. Fabrice, there is an ongoing debate and where, no, and where there is no right answer, which is uh, would fund managers with high concentration would outperform the fund managers with, uh, you know, diversification. And in your case, you're extre on the extreme side, uh, which is, you know, highly diversified. Could you paint a picture, Fabrice, you know, for a fund like yours, which is $295 million dollar, needs to be true for this fund to be a big success. So the concentrated managers who succeed will outperform the diversified managers in one fund. So if you have 10 investments, one of them is 100x, the others are zeros, you have a 10x fund. I will never have a 10x fund because of my diversification. Even if I have a company that's a 1,000x, it will not return the fund because it's so diversified. But in the long run, be 25 years, which is I've been investing now for 25 years, we will outperform all the concentrated funds because the concentrated fund will have massive swings and returns. Once they're 10x, once they're 1x, right? And, and over time, they're going to do way less well than us because venture follows a power law where the top deals account for all the returns. And by our diversification strategy, we end up being in all the top deals. So we've been on the 300 exits we've had, we made money in about over half of them, first of all, which is pretty exceptional. But beyond that, we've been compounding at about 39% realized IR, cash on cash, not monopoly money based on last round valuation for 25 years. And I think that puts us in the very highest echelon of performers. So uh, over long, long periods of time, you're better off doing... Um, uh, diversified. Now, what do I think is a good return for our a fund like ours, given our diversification? A three to four X funds generating 30 to 40% IR is uh, what we've been doing for 25 years and what we expect to be doing for the basically infinite you know, future. Got it. And for base, uh, now you're on to, you know, your, your fund three. Uh, is there anything differently you would have done if you were starting up from scratch today? Yes, uh, many, many lessons learned. Um, 
we started with strategics because strategics came to us and said, hey, we want to be your LP. I mean, we weren't even building a fund. So if I had wanted to build a fund, this is not what I would have done. The problem with strategics, our first LP gave us 50 million for fund one, 50 million for fund two. So 100 million, huge position. And I mean, they were our sole LP in the first one. And then uh, for fund three, they're like, oh, we sold all of our marketplaces. We're no longer interested in marketplaces. We're not going to be in. So when you're strategic LP goes away, you have a massive hole to fill. Um, You're way better off going with institutionals and endowments. Now, it's very hard for fund one to do that. So, but move institutional uh, quicker. We haven't had a single institutional investor yet, and we're at fund three. So our first institutional investors will come at fund four in 2025. And it just means putting the reps in terms of being in front of institutional LPs and structuring yourself in a way to be that, you know, having um, all the audited financials and and, and meeting all of their expectations from a, the way you do the the accounting, the way you do the reporting, et cetera. So being institutional ready from the get-go, which we were not. uh, And part of the reason we're not is kind of intentional. When you have 1,100 companies in the portfolio, and most of them are seed and A, uh, we didn't want to bother them, and so we didn't want to. Add, we didn't gar- We didn't. We didn't uh, make sure we had our information rights at all times. We didn't ask for valuation, so exercises. And so, if that's the case, you can't do gap accounting. We were not gap accounting for until recently, and so I would have gone institutional earlier. And I, I, even though I would take the strategic money, it wouldn't be such a large percentage of my LP base because strategics change strategy and they change strategy faster than you think. Versus if you get an endowment or a pension fund or institutional or sovereign wealth, they're in forever. Now, again, you can't get, you cannot get them fund one, probably not fund, but yeah. starting fund three, I should have done that. Got it. And, uh, and for reasons given your, uh, you know, portfolio construction and you invest across geographies, uh, you know, seems like a lot of this institutional funds, they don't like that strategy. Uh, and how has the, you know, fundraising journey for you, Fabrice, let's say someone, uh, you know, who's looking to start fundraising, build out yeah. a fund uh, from that lens, you know, how are you able to source LPs, build relationship and how to close it? So it's the same way you raise money for a startup. Uh, you, as a startup founder, you go and meet a lot of VCs and uh, you, most of them don't reply to you. Most of them not, don't want what you want, but you just need one. And it's kind of the same strategy here. You kiss a lot of frogs, you know, you. <laughs> you meet all the family offices, you meet all the institutional investors, and you build relationships years ahead of your fundraise. Basically, it, it's like uh, uh, the, I don't know if you saw the movie with Alec Baldwin, where he's like, always be selling. As a fund manager, frankly, as a founder, it's always be raising. You may have just closed your fund, you're still raising. You're getting ready to raise the next one. So is the one thing I would like to change, but I don't think it's changeable in the model. Um <laughs> But it basically means so right now, we're going to go raise our fund four in 2025. We are currently meeting investors nonstop. We're not raising. And in fact, saying we don't, we're not raising, we don't need cash now is an easy way to, an easier way to get a money, uh, to get a meeting because they want to know trends and what we're seeing, what we're learning, et cetera. And so you're always, you know, you know we're doing trips to different geos where you have different, um, uh, potential investors and and in these we are going to do eight ten meetings a day and we'll do it for like a week and so we'll, we're gonna, we're doing the rounds of going to whatever SF or Toronto or, or LA obviously we're based in New York so New York so we'll go to Texas and then we're going to go and we go to the Middle East we go to Riyadh and Abu Dhabi and Dubai and Doha mm-hmm. and, and 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 raise from all the different people wh- or where there's pools of money and again it takes years of building relationships showing trust, you know, telling them you're going to do something and doing that thing. So, oh, we're going to invest in that many companies. We're going to have these types of exits and returns. The DPI will look like that. And you actually deliver the things you promise. Uh, it builds credibility. Um, mm-hmm. And in our case, we also host two conferences a year where we bring LPs, GPs, and founders to talk about like trends, et cetera. And so we invite them to our to our brainstorming sessions or events that are either in my place in Turks and Caicos or in my place in Canada and Rumble Soak. And so, yeah, you build a relationship. You need a very, very broad top of funnel. And mm-hmm. one thing to mention, though, because you said many investors don't like my strategy. That is completely true. Many investors do not like the diversified approach of investing in every stage, every geography, in every industry. Even though we're specialized in marketplaces and network-to-back businesses, they don't like the diversification. I will not convince them 
to change their mind. If someone says, I don't like the strategy, I will not talk to them. You, mm -hmm. you, you're you not going to change someone's mind. If they think it's a bad strategy, you're not going to convince them. So only focus, obviously, on the ones who believe that your strategy is interesting. Got it. And Fabrice, uh, as you said, you know, you already have started raising uh, for Fund 4. Uh, no, no, we haven't started raising. We're yeah. building relationships ahead of a raise. So how do you create urgency? Well, um, create, you have a close, right? Like, so there is a time where you would need a close. So the urgency, the, the, and ideally, if you can get oversubscribed, then you're going to cut people back. And so you basically tell people, I'm going to let you in essentially on a first come first serve basis. And, mm -hmm. uh, and there's a lot of interest and we're closing whatever. Now I would recommend doing a first close in Q1 because uh, LPs have a budget allocation and by the end of the year it's fully allocated. And so in Q1, they still have allocation. So I would do a first close always in like whatever, January, February, March, um, and then give yourself another whatever, six months to close the rest of the capital. And uh, that, that's the way we do it. So no, I'm not raising actively right now. I don't have a fund open, right? Mm -hmm. So it'd be silly to, I have no ask. I go meet them to maintain yeah. relationships, build rapport, explain to them what I'm seeing ahead of going to raise in Q4 24 for a Q1 25 close. Mm -hmm. Got it. And Fabrice, uh, I was going to come to this point where, you know, there's, there's different definitions for building relationship, right? Uh, and if you could paint a picture, maybe with an example, what have you seen over the years is the best way to build relationship uh, before you start raising and uh, and and those and those and those strategies have really worked. For I'm probably the wrong person to ask in FJ Labs because that's really what my partner Jose Marin is uh, the the magician and the expert at. Yeah. Uh, my role is more the razzle dazzle, sell the vision, etc. And and that's it. And and not really build relationship. We have essentially a three person team, which is my my co founding partner Jose Marin, one of our partners Jeff Weinstein, who was managing fundraising for Lux, another uh, very big venture firm, and mm -hmm. we have a head of IR Jay, and they are managing the relationships in terms of uh, I can tell you what I see them doing as opposed to what I'm doing myself. Uh, Jay will send a quarterly newsletter to all the L potential LPs and existing LPs on how things are going uh, and what we're seeing and, and events we've had to stay top of mind. We're going to try to meet them once a quarter in person. We go to them uh, mm -hmm. to listen to where they're at, what they're thinking, how they're thinking about like uh, venture investing as part of their portfolio right now. And and we'll tell them what we're thinking, where we're at, et cetera. Just, and, and just again, build consistency in the relationship and consistency of what you, you, you tell them between the message you say, what you're going to do and what you actually do do end up doing. And that builds trust and rapport. And you're going to meet them before you they invest in you. You're going to meet them 10 times. So yeah. make sure you meet them once a quarter. Got it. And for peace, uh, you know, seems like uh, your angel investing started uh, more of really organically. Uh, you know, you were building a company and other people were inspired by you and they wanted to learn from you and they took you know capital and advice from you over the years you know how have you improved or worked on things uh, around uh, one deal sourcing uh, how do you uh, you know how do you pick and how do you win as well so from the deal sourcing side we are very privileged uh, we've never had to search for deals so the deals, because of our brands and our visibility and, and frankly, my brands around marketplaces, you know, like, why is FJ Labs legitimate in investing in Brazil or India, et cetera? Well, it's because of OLX. We have a lot of deal flow from all these geos because I built a very large companies in all these geos, you know, from, and as a result, we're very privileged. Every week we get 300 deals inbound. The deals, the deals come from three sources. One is... We don't lead, we don't price, so we don't compete with other VCs. The other VCs are our friends. So we have 100 VC relationships covering every stage, geography, and geo and industry. And every three months, we talk to about 100 VCs. On that call, we talk about trends, but we will bring to them all of our companies that need a lead, uh, either for the current round that we're investing in or the next round. And of course, all of our C need an A or A need a B or B need a C. And as a result, we have a lot of companies to bring them. They, The VCs love it. It's differentiated deal flow. In return, they invite us to their deals. 
we're writing a 400k check. They're writing a 10 million dollar check. They don't, they they don't care. We don't take much allocation from them. They're very happy to have us on board, and they want our perspective on the company, especially when it's a marketplace. And then thirdly, the founders love it because we get them in in front of. Andreessen, Greylock, Sequoia, Excel, and we get them funded. It's really a superpower. And in 2023, getting someone funded is extraordinarily valuable. So that win-win-win relationship, uh, symbiotic of the industry, works very well. That's about a third of the deal flow. It's about 100 deals a week. The second 100 deals a week, and it's, 100, it's a third of the deal flow. It's about 55% of the deals we do. So it's the highest quality deal flow. About a third of the deals we get are coming from other founders so that we've backed in the past. So we've invested in 1,100 companies. That's about 2,000 founders. They come back for the next company. They co- they send their friends. They send their employees. That's about 100 deals a week. And again, it's a pretty high quality deal flow. A third of um, uh, of the deals and, and it's about like 25% of the deals we do. And then we get 100 cold inbound. In fact, we get more than that, but let's say qualified enough to re- warrant a reply. Uh, 100 qual- cold inbound, mostly to my LinkedIn and in-mail. And we look at it. And actually, 15% of the deals we've done have come from that as well. And so we actually do look at it. And so we have 300 deals a week. Our team at FJ Labs is 33 people, uh, but it's 11 investors. So we're four partners, two principals, one associate, two analysts. Uh, actually, three principals. And the deals are randomly assigned to one of the investors. doesn't matter the, the seniority. And they decide, should we take a call or not? And now we'll pass because... It's pre-seed. We, don't, we do some pre-seed, but our standard for pre-seed is very high. And often, if we've seen many similar models, we'd rather wait for traction and for one of them to emerge because we don't invest in competitors. So if we bet on someone in pre-seed and someone else in the same category emerges later as a winner, we're screwed. And so we, we want to wait until there's an emerging winner in seed or A or B or whatever the emerging winner is to, in order to invest. Um, so... Is it the right stage for us in light of what we know this category? Uh, is it a category we're interested in? Uh, is, is, is the founder, do they look legitimate? And is there a, or are they trying to raise the right amount of money for what they're trying to do? And if, if the answer is yes, we'll take a call. So we take about 50 calls a week. Again, the calls were randomly assigned to one of the investment team members. In that one hour call, we're going to evaluate four things. Mm-hmm. Do we like the team? Do we like the business? Do we like the deal terms? And do we like the thesis and, the, and what they're trying to do? Now, let me double click on all four of these. And we need all four to be true. Even if an amazing team, if we don't like the business, the economics, we don't do it. So what is an amazing team for us? And every VC will tell you, I only invest in extraordinary people. The thing is, it can't be like porn. It can't be like, oh, I know what it is if I see it. It has yeah. to be very well defined. So for us, it means a founder who's extraordinarily eloquent, a visionary salesperson, because if you can be very eloquent, you can raise money at a higher valuation, you can attract better teams, you can get better BD, ter- BD deals, you can get better PR. Mm-hmm. But it's, it's a necessary but insufficient condition. Because if that's all you have, you can build a very big company, but no unit economics might blow up. Uh, you also need someone who knows how to execute. Now, if you only can execute, you don't have the sales visionary side, you might build a profitable small business. So you need really both. The way in a one-hour call we evaluate if someone can execute is by number two, we, we drill them on the business. Uh, because the TAM, what is the what do the unit economics look like? And even if you're pre-launch, we need you to be able to articulate potential unit economics. Oh, I've done landing page analysis. The density of keywords in Google, Facebook is that, such that the CPC is that. Based on this estimated conversion rate, this is our CAC. Now, uh, the AOV of the product in the industry is this. We expect to be in line with the AOV. This is a margin structure. This is my contribution margin per transaction. We expect that many transactions per year. Before, we think that we fully recoup our CAC after six months on a CM2 basis, and we 3x for CAC on a CM2 basis after 18 months. And who knows what LTV to CAC is? Obviously, we haven't been live that long. right? Like mm-hmm. Something like that is very compelling. Now, if their unit economics are not good, I need to be able to understand why they're going to be get good with scale without every star in the universe aligning. Uh, and the way they express their understanding of their business and unit economics is the way I evaluate whether or not I think they can execute. Number three, what are the deal terms? Now, nothing's cheap in tech, but is it fair in light of the team, the traction, and the category and what they're trying to build? And number four, I have a clear thesis on the future of work, the future of real estate, the future of food. Is it in line with that thesis? Is it trying to solve a problem that I care about? You know, yeah. and I'm mostly trying to solve inequality of opportunity, climate change, and the mental and physical well-being crisis. Is it one of these? And I need all four to be true. If all four are true, 
uh, mm -hmm. we will invest. So we write a vertical deal memo covering all four. Every Tuesday, we have an investment committee meeting of uh, two hours, and we review, in fact, the, this is what I'm doing after this call, we review mm -hmm. the call, the 40, 50 companies of the week before. And on that meeting, we decide, we pass, we, uh, or and if we if we like one company, some one of them partners will take a second call. We take maybe seven calls a, a second calls a week, and based on that, um, we decide what we do. And then usually we invest in three per week. So we go from three hundred to fifty calls to seven second calls to three investments. So about a one percent conversion rate, and that has been working very well for us. And that's kind of the way the funnel works and the approach works. Got it. And uh, Fabrice, uh, so Fabrice, what's you know, over the years, what's the hardest part about building a venture fund for you? Or maybe less discussed topics about uh, venture funds? Um, I'd say the hardest part is probably fundraising um, by far. Like you're always raising, it's hard to get enough capital. You're worried that you're not going to be able to raise your next fund. And, and, and I'd say it's harder to raise capital for a venture fund than it is to raise capital for a startup. For a startup, there's a reasonably well-defined process, and there's a time period by which you need the capital, otherwise you don't operate, uh, and you go under. And so it's rather clear. So for sure, hardest part is, is fundraising for a fund, especially as a first-time GP, if you're starting your fund, versus joining uh, another uh, another fund. And, and, and by the way, that's a very big nuance. Building a fund is kind of like building a startup. You're fundraising, you're defining the strategy, you're defining, you're hiring people, you're defining the culture, et cetera. It's basically building a startup. Um, maybe maybe it, 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 it does, it maybe it's somewhat easier. Uh, it doesn't have the same, you know, 100 hours a week, whatever, we're trying to change the world thing. It's still kind of building a startup. Uh, less discussed things, um, I don't know, everything else to be pretty obvious, to be, to be honest. Got it. And Fabrice, uh, you know, you've been investing uh, in India for some time now, uh, and you've been uh, visiting India because of OLX as mm -hmm. well uh, for for over or for over a decade or more. Uh, you know, what are you? What's your thesis for India, and what yeah. are you most excited about? Uh, you know, in the future. Yeah. So India has extraordinary tailwinds right now. Because there's a fundamental desire by all companies and, frankly, com uh, governments to move supply chains out of China. And they are moving them everywhere, right? Like they're moving to Mexico and Vietnam and Indonesia, et cetera. But frankly, the only place that really has proper scale is India and in terms of like manufacturing capacity and capacity to really replace these supply chains. So our core thesis in India right now is B2B marketplaces helping move supply chains, I guess, French shoring would be the theme, out of China into India. And these marketplaces are mostly helping small factory owners in India that own one factory. And again, think if you're a factory owner in India, what is it you want to be doing? Manufacturing. What is it you don't want to be doing? Answering RFQs, uh, doing prototyping, uh, dealing with customs and exports and tracking and getting paid and invoicing, all that stuff. And so we're investing in marketplaces that, for the most part, help these uh, uh, SMB manufacturer factory owners just do what they like to do, which kind of falls on our thesis, thesis on the future of work. So it's kind of an intersection of French shoring, moving supply chains into from China into India, and future of work. And let me give you examples. We're investors in Ziad, which is a B2B apparel uh, manufacturing company, where Ziad will do the prototypes, will get approved by whatever Zara and H&M, pick the factory that manufactures, will set the price, will do all the work for the, for the factory. We're investors in Shimcart, which is a uh, B2B marketplace for ceramics. We're investors in Dukan, which is a uh, B2B marketplace for linen and and for for rugs. Uh, and the category, and you can do this in every single vertical possible. I mean, and anything that that can be manufactured. And we're mostly doing B2B. Um, we find that the economics work better. You can scale faster. And it's also because in the consumer world. You already have, uh, you know, Zomato and like a lot of it really beautiful uh, user experiences, you know, from Amazon to whatever Uber and 
and Ola or whatever. And so because you have these amazing experiences already in the consumer world with like 15%, 20% penetration, yes, there, it will still grow. It'll go 50%, 60% penetration, but it's 2, 3x. You get mm -hmm. the B2B world and it's like 1% penetration, if that. Everything's done on email and Excel and nothing's digitized. And so there's like infinite growth ahead of you. And so yeah. for us, that's really been our core thesis in India. So our core general thesis at FJ Labs right now is B2B marketplaces. Mm -hmm. of which there are five pillars. Um, one is like putting the inputs online. So um, steel, even finished goods that are inputs in others or, um, met, you know, whatever, uh, any type of metal that you might want to source or mm -hmm. gravel, et cetera. And we have a bunch of these marketplaces. Second big thesis is around SMB enablement and helping SMBs compete with the large chains. Number three has been literally the India specific uh, thesis of French shoring and moving supply chains from China to India. Then number yeah. four has been labor marketplaces to support these. And number five has been all the infrastructure, the, the logistics companies to support this. So we're in Flexport, of course, to do uh, digital freight forwarding internationally. We're in companies like ShipBob in the US. We're in Freightwala in, 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 uh, in India and a bunch of others. So basically, last mile picking and packing logistics types of companies to support these B2B marketplaces. Got it. And Fabrice, uh, you know, someone uh, who's been a founder or operator uh, looking to, you know, start the journey in investing uh, and looking to start a fund potentially, uh, why you think one may want to do a fund and why one should not do a fund? The, so if you're a founder and you're thinking of angel investing, the easiest thing to do is invest in your friends. You know other founders and just back them, right? Like so. That's the easiest way to start getting deal flow, getting your name out, et cetera. Uh, should you do a fund? Unclear. It's a very slow way to get rich. It takes forever, right? If you build a fund, it's a 10-year fund. You're investing for three, four years. Exits come in seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years, right? Like so. Don't do it for the money. Uh, it definitely doesn't work. In the first few funds, you probably don't make any money on management fees either. I mean, we were losing money for the first, like, eight years. I think this is the first year we're break even on fees because, you know, we have 35 people in New York costing 8 million a year. You know, when you have a, when you have a $50 million fund with 2% in management fees, you know, <laughs> you're making a million in fees and you have a 8 million cost structure. It doesn't quite work that way. So you, yeah. I, we, the founders had to be subsidizing the structure for many, many years. So it's a very slow way to become rich. So if that's your ambition, definitely do not take this path. Um, now, the reason I like having a fund uh, and, and is it gives me the firepower to 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 pursue the ideas that I think are interesting and the founder and to back the founders I want to back and also to have the structure I would like to have. So why do we have a fund? Jose and I don't want to be filtering 300 deals a week, most of which are crap. And so actually having a team of 11 people to filter that such that when it comes to us, we're down to seven and they're all good is extraordinarily valuable. Having uh, a CFO and a CEO do all the back office and deal with like I I want to talk to founders either to evaluate them or to help them their portfolio companies and meet and think through trends talk to other VCs all the admin stuff I do not want to do and so actually having a fund that gives me the capital base to outsource to the team I mean so it's not yeah. outsource outsource but like other people to deal with stuff I don't like to do is extremely valuable to me right like my happiness in life is like talking to founders, dreaming about a better world of tomorrow and helping build this better world of tomorrow, it is not doing budgets and accounting and whatever, getting audited by PwC and all that crap. Like, mm -hmm. And so the fact that I can, I have a fund that gives me the firepower to have, or the management fees to be, be able to pay for all this, extraordinarily yeah. valuable. Got it. And uh, uh, Fabrice, you know, it, you, you picked up an important point uh, about uh, deal sourcing, where you said uh, you know, the brand is what's really helping you, where good deals are coming to you. Uh, what's the importance, uh, you know, of brand building and, and how one can go about building a brand? You've built a, a massive brand for yourself. Um, I started by building a brand personally, right? Like, so I was known as the successful marketplace investor that became the successful mark global marketplace investor though Alex. And I basically kind of transitioned that brand to FJ Labs. So my recommendation 
if you're a founder, you typically have one area of expertise, right? Like if you're the founder of Flipkart, you know, you're going to be extremely um, legitimate when it comes to supply chains, inventory management, uh, and, and e-commerce in general, right? Like, so you could probably, uh, you would be very legitimate evaluating investing in these categories. If you build Zomato, you know, you're going to be very legitimate in anything food related, food tech related. You probably know the category. You can be helpful. If you build a big B2B SaaS company, you can be very helpful in, in that. And so stick to your original expertise. And you both probably have founders building around there. You have PRLF have founders reaching out to you and build the brand that way. And then you expand from that expertise into whatever else you want it to be. And so th th that's the strategy that makes the most sense. Stick to your edge and, and build on top of that. And Fabrice, with this, we'll switch gears. Uh, my co-pilot, uh, Alfonso, uh, is coming in and he's asking, what's your typical day like? Starting from waking up to going to bed. It's extremely varied. Um, it's mostly Zoom calls uh, and emails, um, and then personal stuff. So the Zoom calls, I'll do maybe eight to, yeah, eight is probably the median, uh, but there are days where I do 14 uh, per day. Uh, and it's a combination of talking to founders whom I, I'm evaluating whether I want to invest with them or not. Talking to founders that are already in the portfolio to see if I can help them. Talking to other VCs to share deal flow and trends, et cetera. Internal meetings uh, like investment committee, portfolio meeting, uh, strategy meetings, et cetera, that are internal. Um, and those are really the big categories of calls. I guess maybe LP meetings, LP meetings or investor meetings uh, would be the, the fifth category of calls. So these are the fifth categories of calls. And the weight of them varies kind of daily based on whatever. Like we do our investment committee on Tuesdays and we do our management and portfolio calls on Wednesdays. Uh, so we have more of these. We do our crypto investment committee on Monday. So we have more of these in the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then fewer of these later in the week. Um, I get about 300 emails a day that I need to read. I don't need to reply to all of them. I need to, re I need to reply to maybe 150 of them, but I need to read them just for my information. And so I need to allocate a couple hours a day for that. Uh, and then that's basically it. And then the rest is like thinking, writing my blog, uh, and then doing the things I love doing from whatever, kite surfing and playing tennis and playing paddle and playing with my son, playing with my dog and reading. And I read a lot. My routine is I read about a one hour every night before bed. Yeah, got it, got it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, uh, yeah, I was listening to one of the podcasts where I think you read about what 150 uh, books a year, which is a big number. And, and Fabrice, no, no, it's 50 to 100. Uh, 50 it's to not 100. 150. Got it. And Fabrice, what's, uh, you know, what are you most obsessed about outside of work these days? My son and my dog. <laughs> for sure. I have a two-year-old son and I have a beautiful uh, white German shepherd that looks like a white wolf. And uh, yeah, we have, a, we have a blast. And then, but frankly, it's just going on. I like doing, I have a very diversified uh, life post outside of work. I, I host intellectual salons to dream about like the future of humanity is like, you know, religion in 2100. I didn't reinvent democracy for the 21st century in the age of populism. Uh, what's next for AI? Whatever. Like, so I do these intellectual salons. Um, I, I spend a lot of time, um, active sports with so tennis. I'm a very good tennis player and padel and kite surfing and, and extreme skiing and backcountry skiing or heli skiing. I go in these amazing adventure travels where I, I go like survival training the forest. I mean, this year I walked to the South Pole pulling mm -hmm. my 100 pound sled and like negative 50 temperature, my tent, my food, my fuel, et cetera, which are two weeks fully disconnected. And then, mm -hmm. as I said, um, you know, I play video games, I read, and then ah, my son, my family, my my dog. Got it. And personally, uh, Fabrice, have have you changed your mind on something recently? I changed my mind. Uh, so my general philosophy in life is strong opinions loosely held. So if the data proves that I'm wrong, I will change my my, my mind. Um, and I change my mind more often than you think, right? Like, so the, I think the probability of a recession is still higher than consensus, but lower than I thought it was a year ago in the U S for instance, right now, uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, because the data is, is stronger and more compelling than it, than it used to be. Um, I mean, some of the things I've changed my mind on is like five years or six years ago, I didn't want kids at all. I thought kids were, my life was extraordinary. 
and it would be a distraction for my core mission. I love my life. Why would I want kids? All my friends who have kids, they they seem to disappear from my life and or complain about them. And I did a ayahuasca ceremony. And in this ayahuasca ceremony, my grandmother came to visit me and told me, "Look, you lead a non-traditional life. These the you, you can have a non-traditional fatherhood where your kids do not need to be a substitute for your life. They can be a complement. You can take your kid kite surfing and hiking and 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 rock climbing and heli skiing, etc. And um, and it's about the quality of time you spend with them and not the quantity of time. Um, and by the way, the benefits of having kids are greater than you can imagine. And so I left the ceremony and I'm like, okay, I'm having a kid. So, uh, and now I have a two year old and I have a negative three months old on the way. So I've, I'm going to have a daughter in yeah. three months and a half, uh, as well. And same thing. I used to spend a lot of time in the Capitete in the Dominican Republic. I was trying to build a big compound. I had 200 acres of land and I was trying, trying to build an off grid community, where I brought founders, spiritual leaders, and artists to just create. And I was faced with so much corruption and crime, et cetera, it, it just never took off. Um, I was never even able to build the thing. And so mm-hmm. after trying a little hard, I'm like, okay, if you try really hard at something, but it doesn't work, it's not meant to be. And I moved from Dominican Republic to Turks and Caicos in the Caribbean where I am now. And it's been a profound difference has been way, way, way better in every way, in respect to like no tropical diseases, no crime. Uh, and so, yes, uh, these are pretty profound things because I moved from uh, uh, one country to another. I, I changed from not having kids to having kids. And even before, like there was a period of time where I, I didn't want to own anything. And so I lived in Airbnbs. Uh, everything I owned fit in my carry on, my backpack, and my tennis bag. And then in 2015, New York made Airbnb illegal. And so mm. all the high-end inventory went away. And so all the places I used to live in went away. So I tried to live in hotels for a while, but I really didn't like it. And so I got an apartment. And so I went from being completely acid light to having an apartment. Now, of course, if you have a kid, uh, you mm-hmm. also need that. Uh, if you need more than 50 items, which is uh, what I was loving off. Uh, so I've changed, yeah, I've changed my mind on a, f- a fair amount of things. Yeah, yeah. You you are a very interesting personality who lives a very interesting life, uh, Fabrice. We know you as a you know entrepreneur investor. What do your friends know you for? The I think I'm just maybe the happiest person they know, right? Like I'm just happy. I was always happy. I'm built grateful and optimistic and kind. And my I I feel that I'm a shining beacon of light in a universe of darkness, and that I am here to bring love and kindness and to everyone, right? Like so I. The reason I'm a tech founder and an and investor is because I really want to solve the world's problems. And I think mm-hmm. the political system and processes are broken and incapable of addressing uh, climate change and inequality of opportunity. And it's up to us as founders to basically go and solve the world's problems. And the reason I'm an investor in so many companies, by the way, is because there's so many problems. Yeah. And so each founder is a one problem they focus on. Like when you say climate change, it's not one problem. It's a thousand problems. It's mm-hmm. emissions I, 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 when you're making cement, emissions are making steel. Uh, emissions from food, emissions from you know, electricity generation, and all these are different problems that need to be solved differently. And so, but yeah, my friends, very smart, driven, and focused, but kind and happy and yeah. warm-hearted and yeah, generous. Got it. Love it. I love it, Fabrice. Uh, thank you so much for doing this, uh, really coming on the pod and sharing you know, your your journey as an investor and also who are you outside of work, what projects you're working on and just showing us, you know, your your personality outside of uh, work as well. Thank you so much, Fabrice. Well, thank you for having me.